There we go. Yay. Welcome, everyone. So, 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 so grateful for you all to be here. My name is Nicola Core Wordlaw. You have arrived at Lotus Integrative Medicine's talk today on immune resilience. And so once again, we just want to thank you so much. You have so many options and we have so much time on our hands right now. There are so many things that you could be doing, but you chose to be here with us. So once again, we just want to say thank you so much. Um, and so today we have with us Dr. Brendan Arm, Director of the Center, Doctor of Acupuncture. Um, and we have Dr. Teresa Powers, naturopathic doctor, and also soon to be acupuncturist. Um, who will both be speaking today. Oh, sorry about my sound there. Um, and so first things first, we will begin. This is kind of a joint collective. We said that we would bring to you so much information. And one of the things that I feel is super duper important is the concept of just mindset, just where you are mentally, where are you being scattered? Where are you being flustered? Um, I just feel super strongly that our health is starts first and foremost with the mindset that we are in. So I'd like to begin by leading us all in a very brief meditation, if you will. Um, so wherever you are, if you are able, I invite you to close your eyes. And if that is not safe for you, then obviously, please, please don't do that. And just begin by slowly bringing your breath to the present time, to the present space, to your present awareness. Slow your breath, deepen your breath, broaden your breath. And also take a moment, if you are in a seated position, just maybe shift your hips a little bit, rock back and forth, just to feel centered and balanced from side to side, if you can. And as you are finding more relaxation and more depth in your breath, I invite you to Forget about, for just a moment, what was a few moments ago and what is to come a few moments after this. And just bring yourself to where you are right here and right now. And in your mind's eye, Picture a violet colored rose, the size is entirely up to you. If it's still prime, if it's still a baby, or perhaps it's a little more grown, it's a little more robust, that's entirely up to you. But I just want you to see the color See the texture and see the many, many layers of all the petals as they wrap around one another and form the shape of the flower. And just recognizing that in order for this flower to have become there are many different elements that have had to come together. The sunshine, the fertile soil, sufficient water, all of that and many more things have had to come together simultaneously for this flower to grow, to prosper, to bring life, to bring vitality. And so just like this flower, you too are comprised of many, many, many different layers. 
and you too depend upon so much from the earth and from multiple places to help sustain you and to bring you into full vitality, full wellness, full just brilliance, if you will. But like the flower, I ask you to find a space of trust that all things will come together as they should. So continuing with your breath, I ask you to start just above the crown of your head. Just allow your breath to fill up that space on your inhale and just to relax it on your exhale. Just bring your life energy right there. And we're gonna slowly send that breath and that energy all the way down our body. So slowly moving down the crown of the head, through the forehead and skull, through the eyes, nasal passages, through your mouth and throat, the entire neck area. Remaining with your full breath. Continuing to travel down to your shoulders, upper back, to your heart space, to your lungs, diaphragm, all of the organs that come beneath. The stomach, kidneys on the back, all of the intestines, all of the musculature, the tissue, everything that encompasses right within. Again, finding your breath, finding your life, finding your expansion, finding your support. Continuing to travel to your lower back, your hips, thighs, hamstrings, slowly moving down to the knees, the shins, the calves, the ankles, the feet, toes, heels, and lastly to the soles of the feet. And just pause right there at the soles. Holding your breath right there for just a moment. Allowing your full support to find its breath. And then slowly moving just an inch or two beyond the soles of the feet, just as we did just above the head. I'd like us to find the space just below the soles of our feet. And again, just continuing with the expansion with your breath and life force.
And then when you're ready, slowly moving the breath across one side. I like to move to my left side and making a full circle around my left side, bringing it all the way back up to the crown of my head and above the crown and slowly moving down my right side all the way back down to just beyond the soles of the feet. And if you can see your life and your energy rotating around yourself one more time, all the way around, all the way up to the top, coming back down your side, the, my right side, maybe your right side as well. And then one final time, up your left side, over your head, down your right side. And again, just pausing just below the soles of the feet. Just a few more deep breaths. And slowly bringing that breath right to your heart. Feel free to place your hands on your heart if you'd like. Take three more breaths in your own time. And on your final one, on your exhale, you can slowly begin to blink your eyes open, very slowly. And then just noticing the space around you, if you're indoors, noticing the room, the other walls, any furniture or other things surrounding you in your space. And then bringing your awareness to what it is that you might be seated on. And then slowly bringing your eyes back to your screen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope that that was fulfilling to you, rewarding to you, brought you food for your soul. Hmm. Ah. And so we're slowly going to move into our next person, which is, I believe, Dr. Powers. And so we'll, oh, you got it, go ahead. Mute myself. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Teresa Powers. I am a naturopathic doctor practicing at Lotus Integrative Medicine. I'm going to talk to you today about some things that can really help with your immune system. And there, I like to really work with the foundations of medicine, which is food, sleep, water, connection to other people. If we don't have those things in place, um, we can dump supplements in our body all day long and it really won't do a lot to be effective if we don't have those foundations in place. So really, um, one of my biggest things is eating five to seven servings of vegetables per day. Um, it make it be a rainbow of colors. Like you want to get all different shades in there because these provide the vitamins and minerals and the fiber that we need for a healthy immune system. Now, when I say servings, um, what I'm talking about is a half a cup of a chopped vegetable, something like um, a pepper or a zucchini or a full cup of some sort of leafy green. And I would really encourage you to eat leafy greens every single day. Um, another good way to get those servings in is to sneak them into your breakfast. Um, one of the things I like to do is roast like a kabocha squash or butternut squash and add that to something like oatmeal. Um, another good way to do it, if you like to cook eggs, you can um, 
add onions and peppers and you can do greens with that as well. So you can, you can sneak in like two to three servings just in your breakfast alone. And that's a time where people just tend to eat a lot of carbohydrates. Um, so it's a great time to be working on your digestion, getting the junk food out of your diet. Um, you don't have all the social pressures to be eating out with other people. So making food choices that way, um, you gotta be home cooking. And so you're not so much on the go either and dependent on restaurants. Um, you know, we still wanna support our local restaurants, but maybe making different food choices for, you know, the 90% of the time you're eating at home. Our gut is our foundation of our immune system and it's so important. So if there's some stuff that's been bothering you, like this is a great time to be working on it um, because it is just such um, a foundation of our health and we wanna keep the gut lining strong. So really our GI system is considered outside world. So you wanna keep that separate from your insides and make sure that that lining is really, really strong. Um, along those lines, limiting sugar intake is really key. Um, those, that white sugar from cane sugar, it causes inflammation and it actually suppresses our white blood cells and we don't wanna be doing that right now. So limiting sugar, if it's not in your house, you probably won't go out right now to get it. So <laughs> this is a great time to purge your pantry of that stuff if it's something like you really struggle with being able to say no to in your house. But if you're not in the outside world, great time to really do a sugar detox um, and, and get it out of there. Um, my other suggestion is don't drink your way through quarantine. I see the Facebook posts. I know what you all are up to. Um, so we need an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which works in our liver to process the alcohol. And it uses B vitamins and zinc. And we need those to do other things right now. We don't wanna be putting extra pressure on our liver with the alcohol and the sugar. Like we need it to be doing something else right now. So along those lines, drinking water and not your calories. Um, it's very confusing to our system to have liquid calories coming in with no fiber. So sweetened beverages, fruit juices, um, this fake sugars too. Oh my gosh, fake sugars really throw away, throw um, our blood chemistry into a tizzy because it's, it's very confusing because that you sense sweetness in your duodenum which is the beginning part of your small intestine, but there's actually no sugar to even react on. So I recommend drinking water, teas, um, herbal teas, or even unsweetened teas. And I mean, if you wanna have a cup of coffee a day, fine, like just not adding extra sugar to it. Um, and then getting sleep seven to nine hours per night of, of good rest. And that part of that is being able to go to bed by 10.30 p.m. Um, Dr. Arm will talk about this more, but it's about your cortisol and melatonin levels. So you want a high cortisol level in the morning and then throughout the day, it's gonna taper down and then your melatonin levels go up. Um, so I know people think that they're night owls and I used to be one of them and I'm still, I still struggle with it, honestly. Um, but what happens at night is you get a really subtle, like go to sleep message around like nine, nine thirty, And if you ignore that message, you get a second cortisol spike, the second win. And then it actually suppresses your melatonin production. And then you're up till one o'clock in the morning until you absolutely have to pass out. So really you, being in bed and ready to go to sleep by 10, 10 30. And that doesn't mean like being on your phone and reading emails and doing all that stuff. Like having your teeth brush ready to go is super key because you should wake up feeling rested and not like you just got run over by a truck and you now need coffee to function. So also getting exercise, um, you know, we are allowed to go outside. So um, doing, taking walks, you gotta move the lymphatic system because the lymphatic system is a, a big part of our immune system. It's this really thin fluid that runs with our, our veins and the way that it moves through our body and cleans stuff up is actually the pumping of muscles. So getting that moving is really key to making sure that everything is getting um, detoxified and moved through your system. Home hydrotherapy is also a good way to do this. I have tons of home techniques that I will be more than happy to go 
through later, but right now my biggest one is um, ending your shower with cool or cold water. Now, a lot of people think this sounds horrific. It's actually getting warm in LA, so that might sound like a good idea now, but this just seals in all your pores, and it actually, it's about exercising blood vessels with hydrotherapy, so opening and closing them, and it also moves the lymphatic system. So I hope you all found this helpful. Um, I've got tons of tips, but you know, really working with the basics and getting that thing locked down is going to be your best bet for a strong and healthy immune system. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Um, and also I wanna bring up that if you do have questions, I did type it into the chat that feel free to type in any questions that you may have along the way directly into the chat and we'll bring them up after we're done. So after Dr. Arm is finished um, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So thank you again, Dr. Powers and Dr. Arm. We'll let you... Oh, okay, great. All right, so hi there. Uh, let me first um, see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Uh, Let's see. Um, can everybody hear me okay? It, I, uh, we got a nod of yes. You guys can all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, great, 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 great. Oh, let me just, uh, oops. Okay. Um, uh, hi, uh, my name is Dr. Brendan Arm. Uh, I'm a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. I'm also a licensed acupuncturist. Uh, I'm the director and founder of uh, Lotus Integrative Medicine uh, here in um, Santa Monica, California. Um, I put together this PowerPoint presentation, which I'm very excited to share with you. So I hope everybody can see it. I'm pretty certain we can all say, okay, thumbs up, we can see it. Great, okay, so far it's working well. Um, and is, are we scrolling to the next one? Let's see, hold on. We scroll to the next one? Okay, great, all right. All right, so uh, what I wanna talk about is immune resiliency or immune resilience. And what is immune resilience? Um, well, it's our ability to keep our immune system strong. Uh, or if our immune system, we get uh, hit with something, um, our ability to recover quickly. You know, if we get ill, um, how ill do we get and how quickly do we um, bounce back? Oops, okay. Um, now there are some things that there are different causes of why the immune system gets depleted or weakened. And from a Chinese perspective, which I'm gonna weave through this um, presentation because I'm an ambassador of Chinese medicine. Um, from a Chinese perspective, we talk about uh, when the immune system is weak, we're oftentimes referring to a spleen weakness or the spleen chi energy has gotten weak. So let me just pause there for a second. In Chinese medicine, um, it's a whole system of medicine where uh, the, the idea is energy moves through the body, uh, it goes uh, to the organ and each organ has uh, you know, various physiological effects that are recognized in Western medicine, but there's also other things that this, the organ has some type of jurisdiction or control over in Chinese medicine, which is a little different than Western medicine. So for example, the spleen in Chinese medicine governs the immune system. It also governs your digestion and also your mental health and also the strength of your muscles. So for those of us, uh, and I'm sure there are many of us um, that have that mental overexertion, uh, you know, they always are worrying. They're uh, worry wars, they're very pensive, a lot of brooding, overthinking. That can deplete the energy of the spleen which can make the immune system get weaker. Also, if you do too much physical overexertion, or you don't eat well, or you don't sleep well, or just aging, or other lifestyle th uh, things, which we'll get into, all that can deplete the immune system. Um, on the other side, we want to do different things to help strengthen or create a healthy spleen tree, or healthy immune system, or healthy uh, immune resiliency. That way we can stay well, or we can get back into a state of wellness. So what I wanna share is what would a daily lifestyle be to help support your immune system, 
okay? So that if you're healthy, you stay well healthy, or if you're sick, perhaps in time you can have a stronger immune system and get better. Um, that would be a morning, day, and evening kind of plan. So in the morning, in Chinese medicine, we, we like to get up nice and early, you know, and it would be seven days a week, not this weekend warrior where you sleep in or your weekend warrior and you get up early and do lots of exercise, but whatever your pattern, seven days a week, okay? And in the morning, try to have some a mindfulness practice, something to set a good intention for the day, you know? Also, that exercise first thing in the morning is, is you know, the vigorous exercise that pumps the blood, that gets the lymphatics going, is the most important time, maybe 30, 60 minutes a day. Again, in that idea of mindset, very important to be positive, you know, to be, that way you can be a good listener. You can try to approach the day with a level of compassion, you know, love and kindness of the things that you're working on. So try to instill first in the morning some activities that would get you into a spirit of loving kindness. You know, it's important to eat a frog first thing in the morning. I don't think he's, re he's not referring to literally a frog, but what he means is if, you know, we have a number of things that we need to do throughout the day, some of them are very challenging. If first thing in the morning you can try to check off one of those most challenging things of the day, it really sets the, the day for success. You know, you have an early accomplishment. Okay, a big one in Chinese medicine is diet, of course. You know, and there's certain foods that would be very good and healthy for the spleen or healthy for the immune system, and there's foods that aren't so healthy. The ones I just wanted to point out, in Chinese medicine, when you talk about the spleen or stomach, we, 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 we say the spleen and stomach is governed by the earth element. You know, there, there's this whole set of, uh, system in Chinese medicine of different elements. So the one that governs our digestion, our immune system is the earth elements. So foods that are grown close to or in the earth, you know, root vegetables, uh, parsnips, uh, carrots, um, onions, garlics, um, beets, radishes, turnips, um, potatoes, that kind of stuff that's grown in the earth or even close to the earth, like rice or grains. Another big one I want to point out is this idea in Chinese medicine, a clear, bland diet. Clear meaning clear liquids, you know, bland meaning limited flavor. That type of stuff that's the slow cooked liquids, the stews, um, that, that, that's a lot easier. It's more warming. It tends to be more warming, which the digestion likes. And it's easier to digest, you know, so that the body can transform the food into some type of healthy energy, which will, you know, support our immune system. Foods that have a lot of flavor, spicy, fried, greasy foods, the sugar, stuff like this, it takes a lot more energy to break it down. And therefore, there's less energy for your body to have on the surface of the skin to protect yourself or the immune system. Okay. Also in Chinese medicine, recognize that this, this method of medicine comes from an Asian culture where uh, typically there's a large breakfast, moderate lunch, and a light dinner. Uh, to point again, some foods that are very good, this idea of the slow cooked foods, I just want to reemphasize that. Whether it's a Chinese rice porridge, which is like rice and uh, a stewed, like vegetables stewed together, or kitri, which is like dal and vegetables, you know, like more from an Ayurvedic or Indian perspective you know, with the vegetables that are slow cooked or like a, you know, um, uh, like a miso soup or, um, you know, like a mulligatoni soup or some types of soups that are, again, slow cooked or even like a bone broth, stuff that's slow cooked tends to be more healthy. And certainly don't forget your probiotics. That can be very helpful too. There's some other foods noted that are less, not so good in the foods perhaps to avoid. Um, not just the foods you eat, but trying to get in the spirit of it. And also the practicing the joy of cooking, cooking by yourself, cooking with friends that you may be living with right now or family. And in time, you know, getting, spending more time with other friends and other family and cooking together, you know, that can be a nice activity and very good for your immune system. And if there are certain food recommendations from a Chinese perspective that don't work for you, you know, maybe you have a food allergy, then you might have to get some type of testing to see which ones don't work for you as an individual and then even though it's in the Chinese medicine would be recommended, it's not so good for you, so you wouldn't eat it. I think food journaling is also a very interesting idea to, you know, to, to work with a professional on. Um, to come back to Chinese medicine, you know, herbalism is a, is a big uh, component to it. You know, when you're working with a, a licensed practitioner, you know, they tend to 
you know, do a comprehensive job of getting the background the history, customized formula based on you, whatever, you know, your pattern, dis, your, 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 your pattern disharmony is, is, you know, so just for, for educational purposes, there's a formula that's very commonly used in Chinese medicine for uh, the immune system to help support it. It's called Yuping Feng San, also known in English as Jade Windscreen Powder. Uh, this is a good formula for helping regulate function. Also another formula that's used for respiratory system uh, diseases. Same formula. Uh, but again, remember, your practitioner oftentimes won't necessarily give you just a straight formula like this. They may modify it based on you. Another one of my favorites is Buzong Ichitan, which tonifies, which means tono, which translates as tonify the middle and augment the qi decoction. This is also a very good formula for as an uh, help with allergies and as an anti-inflammatory. Shifting gears from, from Chinese herbalism, you know, there's also discussion, obviously, in Chinese medicine for acupuncture and the benefits of that. Now, again, this really depends on your condition. You know, it depends on many factors. But in general, you know, you tend to work with somebody more short-term care when it's an acute issue or something that's, 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 that's a, uh, not a long-standing issue. And you tend to work with somebody more regularly for, for, for chronic issues. So now let's move from daytime into evening. We went from morning to daytime into evening. I, this is a very important um, uh, thing to point out that I, uh, I'm sure we all are working on is, how do you manage the work-life balance? You know, when does time end for work? And when does time begin for yourself and or yourself and your partner or yourself and your partner, your family or your family, whatever it may be. You know, and I think that's very important to define at what point you kind of close down the office or the work stuff and you start spending time uh, with, with, with the, the more personal stuff. Uh, just practicing that over time can be strengthening to your immune system. Again, in the evening, it's a time to unwind. Very important to get off media a few hours before you go to sleep, at least two. Otherwise, it's too disturbing. It causes too much anxiety. And, and, and whether you want to turn off the brain or not, it just, it's, it's sometimes you'll find yourself with a whole nights of, of just restless sleep based on just watching the media or something that's too stimulant at nighttime. An evening walk or spending time in nature. And even nowadays, you know, even if it's just opening up the window and looking out the window and looking at the spring flowers, you know, in the sunshine, that's daytime, evening time. Maybe you'll look at the moon or the stars, you know. Even in the evening time conversations with, friends or families, you know, to reconnect, to check in. Uh, some movement in the evening is also very good for the immune system, you know, but this type of movement is different than the movement or the exercise in the, the morning, which is more vigorous. In the evening, this is the time to do uh, like more stretching. If you're going to do certain po uh, postures or asanas, they call it in, in, you know, in yoga practice, maybe you do fewer practices fewer postures and you hold them a longer time. So it's less for the muscle developing, you know, and helping to calm the nervous system. Again, yoga or uh, restorative practices like this, you know, are to that um, purpose. I also find evening time something of, of reading or listening to, you know, so for stress management. You know, I'll point out a few of my favorite teachers. The Dalai Lama, for example. This is a teacher I, I have seen many times um, and read quite a bit and, and enjoyed listening to quite a bit. I spent uh, several weeks uh, with him and other people and other monks um, in um, Dharamsala, which is in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is in Northwestern India, um, about, about 20 years ago. And I remember, and I still think on this often, you know, the level of compassion how he stresses the energy of loving kindness and compassion and intolerance. Being around inspiring teachers like this can help that energy in ourself. And that in itself will calm the mind so that the energy is more available for the immune system. I also point out Thich Nhat Hanh, another one of my favorite teachers, a master, I believe he's in his early 90s, 93, a master at mindfulness uh, practices. What does that mean? Whatever you're doing, just be present is his message. Whether you're cleaning a, you know, a teacup or peeling an, a tangerine or at a stop sign, you know, smile. 
Um, you know, he, he, he mentions quite a bit about it's so easy for us to get caught in the past and have difficulty letting go, you know, or grieving because of what's happening now isn't like the way it was before and how much energy that uses up that could otherwise be used for your, you know, immune system. Um, and at the same token, in the future, you know, some of us are so anxious or fearful, you know, of what's going to happen in the future. Again, causing a lot of using up of this vital energy that is, will no longer be available for immune system. So his practices of mindfulness breathing be in the present moment. My final last teacher I want to share, Amachi, is another teacher I've been following for about 30 years. Um, she comes to LA, you know, uh, every June. Uh, I, I, I also uh, spent quite a bit of time with her in India over a month uh, many, many years ago. And, you know, she's, she's known as the hugging saint. Um, what is her, her message? Her message to me is, you know, whatever you're doing with yourself and your life, uh, you know, try to be of service to people. She's pushing this message of selfless service to help others, to feel the embrace of nature and everything that's around us, you know, and instead of being so concerned and worried about ourselves, go up, be of service to other people, and then they don't have that worry about ourselves, so we don't suffer as much. You know, she says, especially during this time, how important is the suffering of others just to be there to help support people, just to hold that space. So meditation at the end of the day, a little different than the morning, but can be very similar. Um, I like these two practices. One of them is very simple. You can just inhale and you can think the word let and exhale. You can think the word go and you can practice 10, 15 minutes every evening, letting go of thoughts and emotions. Or another practice that I recommend, uh, you can go online and you can find this yourself. You know, if you, if you do a keyword search of spleen meridian or spleen channel, you know, and then click images and then print it out, you'll see how that, the, where the spleen channel goes. Again, remember the spleen is the one that's uh, chiefly or, uh, you know, mainly responsible for the immune system. There are other organs too, the lung and the kidney, stuff like this, but the spleen is a very important one. A lot of the herbs, the tonal fights, um, the, the immune system, Chinese medicine, or herbs that tonify the spleen. So at any rate, if you do, if you print out this meditation, uh, you know, the, the channel of the spleen meridian and see how it goes from the feet up into like the, the rib cage on both sides of the body and you focus and you meditate on that, you know, that in itself might help support your spleen energy. Okay, so for adults, very important to get before, uh, to get to bed before 11 p.m. Chinese medicine, they'd like you to be asleep before, you know, 7 or 9 p.m but definitely be before 11 p.m. In Chinese medicine, every two hours, a different organ is illuminated, okay? Some organs you're supposed to be awake for, and some organs you're supposed to be unconscious or asleep for. The gallbladder is the one between, that starts at 11 and goes to 1 a.m. That is when you're very, it's very important to, you know, uh, to, so that your body can do the, the important healing that it needs to do for the immune system and others. It's very important that you're unconscious for that. If you're awake during that hour, it can cause a gallbladder disharmony. And that can cause us to have more anxiety and more anxiousness and have a lower immune system. I'm also a big fan of uh, the evening ritual. I love my evening shower. I like my morning shower too. But I think to refresh, to cleanse, wash away the day, the evening shower is crucial. I am a lanky, sinewy, make a lot of cracks and stuff like this. Uh, we call that a wood constitution in Chinese medicine. You know, a lot of always thinking of the future and always working hard on things and stuff like that. And that's very much what the, like the Western mindset culture is a, is a very wood predominant culture. So in Chinese medicine, that which nourishes wood is water. So being around water, taking that evening shower, drinking water, you know, listening to a water fountain, you know, things like this, eating foods that come from water, fish or seaweed can all be very helpful. I also think fresh linens and fresh clothing when you're sleeping can be very helpful. And from a lot of my, uh, I've heard from, from several naturopathic colleagues, you know, sometimes in order to get anchored in sleep, we need a little more protein. So little almonds or walnuts, maybe a handful or two, you know, just to help us you know, 
again, in Chinese medicine, they talk about the strength of your liver blood. A little protein can strengthen the liver blood, the blood that can help anchor the Shen or help anchor the spirit of the heart so you can get into that sleep state. I really enjoy this one at nighttime. A prayer for peace. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu. May all beings everywhere be happy and free. A very nice mantra. Even Amma talks about you know, uh, chanting this a hundred times every night right now, you know, which takes about eight minutes and I'm working on it myself. So in conclusion, immune resiliency. How do we strengthen the immune system? Number one, I'd say a daily mindfulness to practices that help support our immune system as opposed to things that may weaken our immune system. Number two, you know, trying to look at this from a three-pronged perspective. There is some work we need to do because of our own deep interest. We want to get better, okay? There's also some, there's also like a, a second part would be, you know, feeling connected to a sense of community, a sense of support, you know, so working with, you know, a, a healthcare provider or having a group, you know, you're all working together for good health. And the third thing is some type of inspiration, you know, maybe a teacher or a mentor or some, some of the three I mentioned, you know, all these, that three or that like the, maybe the three treasures of good immune system, you know, those might perhaps be ones to consider. So each of you will receive, you know, a, a, a copy of the video of the presentation. And please let us, you know, please feel free to sh uh, share it with friends, coworkers, families, et cetera. We are here to help. And may all beings be uh, free from suffering. You know, blessings and thank you. And just a little more detail about our contact information. So I'm going to pass it back to Nicole and say thank you very much for, you know, uh, being so generous to listen. I hope it's helpful. Thank you, Dr. Arm. There we go. Yay. All right, so you're still unmuted, and I will unmute Dr. Powers as well, or you can unmute yourself, whichever is easier. There we go. All right, so once again, just remember, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. I've collected a couple, um, and one of the first ones that we got was a question about supplements for liver health. Do either of you... Mm -hmm. Want to take? Yeah, that? so those are really individually based. Um, I mean, there's some general ones, but it's it's always best to work with a practitioner when you're talking about supplements. Um, milk thistle is super great. Um, it's antioxidant to the liver, kidneys, and heart, and it's what we call a tropho restorative. So it helps restore those organs. Um, and just food, I like to do a lot of liver foods like beets, artichokes, um, things that move that. Dandelion root is super great for the liver. Um, th there are so many, um, but supplement wise, I think it's really best to work with a practitioner for that to see what you are missing. Great, thank you. Anything to add, Dr. Arm? Well, I might add, you know, uh, uh, it's not really from a Chinese perspective as much, but the liposomal glutathione you know, for some people can help clean the liver or help the burden, toxic burden in the liver. From a Chinese perspective, they would either say it's a deficiency-based pattern. So if there's a liver blood deficiency or liver yin deficiency, then you'd work on herbs to help support liver blood and, and uh, liver yin. Um, and there's a whole multitude or, but more like, oftentimes it's, it's um, more chi or blood stagnation, which is an excess condition related to liver. So that starts getting into the category of herbs that, you know, I'm going to rattle a couple off, but and again, you should work with somebody, but, you know, Shao Chai Hu Tong, Shai Hu Tong, um, Chai Hu Shu Gan Tong, um, those are all herbs that help with the stagnation of the liver, which is very, very common. Great. Thank you. All right. Another question, and this, I think, was touched upon a little bit by you both, but maybe we can get even a more narrowed down um, answer from the both of you the best vegetables to eat? Okay, I, I like to like think that there's all vegetables have merit. Um, so, you know, they all do different things. They all have different components to them. Some of them are more high in sulfur, which can be um, really helpful. 
Um, I, I, if you tolerate them well, like leafy greens, I think are super great because they have so much stuff, but eating a variety of them and switching them up and just, I have to stress variety of vegetables, like eating the, like, I don't know. I know lots of kids who eat like carrots and cucumbers every day and that's it. It's not enough. Like you need more variety than that. And, um, just getting in all the different kinds. Um, and if there's some you don't tolerate well, then try others and go back to those and see if you tolerate them at a later point. Um, I struggle with like the broccoli and cauliflower ones now, which I didn't as a kid, but um, those are great too. Um, but yeah, eat the ones that you like, but always add more in. I like to go to different markets, like, you know, Indian markets, Chinese markets, Asian markets, like, cause they will have different kinds of vegetables and I'll ask them, how do you cook that? And um, you can find some really cool stuff that way. Thank you. I think I might add that um, uh, eating in the color of the rainbow can be a nice, uh, a nice, nice, nice visual and nice and simple. Um, also from a Chinese perspective, it depends on your predominant imbalance. So for example, if you have a predominantly water imbalance, which means kidney and bladder imbalance, then they would typically say eating foods that are more dark blue or black. If you have a fire, if, sorry, if you have a wood imbalance, you know, which is liver and gallbladder disharmony or something to that effect, then you tend to eat more green foods. If it's more spleen stomach or earth imbalance, you tend to have more yellow or orange foods. If it's a lung imbalance, large intestine imbalance, which is more of a metal issue, then you tend to have white or gray. You know, or if it's a fire imbalance of the heart and small intestine, or gallbladder and sanjiao, then you tend to have more of the red, you know, red foods. Great. And again, that's also obviously very specific to the individual. So knowing where you are and where you lie and getting the, you know, the help of a practitioner is important. Um, so we've got about two, maybe I think two more. Yeah. I have one, um, one that might be easier to answer than another, but, um, one question is specifically to you, to Dr. Arm about, for instance, the gallbladder refreshing between 11 and one, um, how does time zone impact that? Does it matter? Is it, you know, is it wherever you are, you know, on the globe? Yes. Yes, to make it simple, yes. Uh, you know, this is an old medicine, 5,000, you know, uh, certainly 5,000 years old, at least, uh, you know, conversations regarding acupuncture. Herbalism, tens of thousands of years old, at least. Um, so long ago, there weren't planes, so people stayed in one area. So there really wasn't an issue of uh, needing to answer that question because it never really came up. But now it does throw things off, you know, especially with jet lag. Um, but assuming you're not moving around constantly, which brings its own issue, then you would choose the, the, where you are, where the time zone in which you are. Right. Yeah, I find them very linked to circadian rhythms. It's, it's kind of the same idea. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, and then we have one question asking about detox pathways. So one person has found in their research and reading that having a good way to detox can impact the difference between mild to more severe symptoms. And they didn't specify if this was in particular to anything um, or if this is just in general, any, any issues. Um, do either of you have some information to share about that? Well, your liver has, okay, all your organs detox things, your skin, your liver, your kidneys, um, even your emotions are a way of detoxing and your liver GI is a big, big way of detoxing things. Um, so there's chemical detox and then there's like actually being able to eliminate waste. Those are two ways of doing it. Um, I think what's really important to remember about detox is that you have to give your body the, the micronutrients that it needs to run those pathways effectively. Um, we talk about rate limiting steps in chemistry where let's say you need um, four ingredients to run a pathway, but like you're deficient in one of them. And so it blocks up the whole thing. So that's why like getting those nutrients from 
things like vegetables are so important so that you can run those effectively and have just a stronger system that's not overreactive to things like, you know, allergies are a way that our immune system is overreacting to things. And if your, your pathways are more clear, you see a lot less of that. And also making sure your GI integrity is really good and that that's restored. Because if, you're, if people eat a standard American diet, their guts are usually a mess. So um, just lots of processed grains, it, it can be really hard on the system. So having those all in place when you get sick, um, you know, people tend to recover quicker. Right. I want to share on that. Um, I guess it also, uh, there's so many ways that you can have toxicity in your body. Um, as you said, emotional or physical or, and, and probably a whole bunch like that. Um, so it's good to take note of, say, for example, if you have like a heavy metal and you're trying to detox, maybe there's a certain pathway with that, maybe with chelation or, or, or some other way, or if it's emotional toxicity, well, then that's a whole other process of how to detox from that. But let me just speak for just for a moment from a Chinese perspective. The, the burden in the body come, tends to come from, we would consider an excess case, you know, at least the initial, what, what, what we see, you know, maybe it's too much stagnation or too much phlegm accumulation, you know, so the treatment strategy, you have to go back to a pattern differentiation in Chinese medicine. If that particular individual, do they have chi or blood stagnation? And if so, give them herbs and acupuncture and lifestyle recommendations and diet based on moving the chi or blood. Or if it's like a damp or phlegm accumulation, you know, then giving words, herbs to help, you know, drain the dampness or expel the phlegm, you know, help to uh, room out, move out that turbidity. That's all goes for, for an excess case. If it's a deficiency type pattern, why they have so much, you know, burden in their body, meaning like they're just so run down that the tiniest little things, which isn't a problem for anybody else, sees that gives them trouble, then you really have to start working on what type of deficiency is this? Is this a yin deficiency, blood deficiency, chi deficiency, yang deficiency, combination of things. And then you'd give acupuncture and herbs. So that's, it's, it's a very challenging questions to, to be able to give a broad answer on because it depends on the presentation of that individual. So that being said, you know, how do you have proper elimination, you know, a, a detox pathways? Uh, I guess it circles back to a lot of the things all three of us have been talking about today, doing things to help support our system, you know, and working with someone to help us along the way. Great. Great, thank you. Okay, so we still have a few more, but I also want to be aware of everyone's time. We're so grateful again that you have come here, um, but we could probably be here all day. <laughs> um, so one other quick question is, how does iridology fit in with Chinese medicine or does it? And mm -hmm. is it recommended? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, iridology. Um, it isn't covered too much in the basic training, at least in the American training settings from a four year, I did the four year um, master's training, then I did another two year doctorate. So it was a total of six year postgraduate. It's not really covered, at least in the fundamental training. Perhaps there may be elective classes you could take in it because it is sort of a holistic you know, approach, of course, and Chinese medicine falls into that category as well. So some acupuncturists, you know, do take interest and learn about it. But I'm not aware, you know, uh, from my education and my training and my background from the books that we're, um, you know, responsible for when we take our state board exams, it's not taught in either the master's or da do doctorate level. Um, that being said, Chinese medicine also likes this concept of microsystems. You know, what does that mean? Well, you should be able to diagnose and treat any and all things, you know, body, mind, and spirit uh, through a microsystem. So a small segment of the body, say in the ear called auricular therapy, or in the hand, or in the foot, or something like this, or in the eye, as in iridology. So, I just don't know too much about it. It's, I, I just haven't had too much exposure to it. Um, and, I, and, and from a herbal's perspective, uh, we, we don't see it in our uh, 
herbology books or pharmacology, you know, or, or, or our, you know, our herbology or our patent books too often. I, I, not at all that I can recall. Okay. Do you have anything to speak about it, Dr. Powers, at all? I mean, I've, I've heard of it. I, I know some people who practice it. It's, I've, I know very little about it. I just know okay. it, it exists. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I want to jump to, um, so the, the title of our talk is Immune Resilience. And so someone pointed to um, how to restore the immune system after illness. Like if they're still tired, still feeling vulnerable, or maybe they are still vulnerable, still feeling susceptible. Um, is it all of the things that we've already talked about um, and just continuing with those things? Are there others? Um, any insight on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I would have to, I think, get to know that person and find out what their life and lifestyle is. Because I think any of the things that both of us shared could be very helpful. So you got to find out, does this person have a good sleep pattern? Do they have a good eating pattern? Do they have a good support system? You know, do they have a supportive relationship? You know, do they, you know, what, what is their mind like? You know, um, because it sounds like that person is in a deficiency based part of their life, you know? So, introducing something into the body like food or herbs um, might be very helpful, you know? Um, or maybe just some changing some lifestyle things and maybe needing taking some things out that may be draining them. Uh, it, it's hard to know without specifics, but that's, that's, that's a summary. In, in general, too, I would say making sure you're eating um, really easy to digest food and cooking your vegetables, even if you're steaming or blanching them. Um, you know, we became human because we, we figured out fire, right? So we don't have to spend all day like gorillas do eating um, because they haven't figured out fire yet. We have. So to get those nutrient dense foods, just cooking them a little bit, we don't have to expend so much energy digesting them. And that can be really um, great for like healing from illness and doing like, so, like broths and soups and stuff like that. And also in the Western and the Eastern Materia Medicas for herbs, you see a lot of herbs that talk about like, oh, this is for the person who's recovering from illness um, because they help build back up. But, um, you know, those would have to be prescribed on an individual basis, but there's lots of things to start building up afterwards that can be helpful. And also not trying to get back to strenuous exercise too quickly. Like, I mean, you want to do breathing exercises and that kind of things to always keep your lungs open, but like strenuous exercise just can deplete you even further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. The importance of sunshine and vitamin D3, and in particular, in relation to respiratory insufficiency. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so I always check patients to see where their vitamin D levels are at, which is a blood test. And the reason I do this is for two reasons. One, do they have enough? Do they need to be supplemented? And if they do need to be supplemented, how much supplementing do they need each day? Um, sunshine is a great way to get it in limited amounts. Um, me personally, I'm on anti-rejection medication and I can't be spending lots of time in the sun. I'm at risk for skin cancer. So I have to be really careful about that. So you have to be mindful about that kind of thing and, and maybe protecting areas that get lots of skin, ex uh, sun exposure and like exposing other areas that, you know, just a little bit each day, um, but again, I, you really got to check your own levels, but um, they definitely, like getting optimal vitamin D levels are very helpful to the immune system. And so if I could also add just a quick, quick note on that one. Um, sometimes that morning sunlight, you know, when the yang is still growing, you know, it's still building, the sun is still coming up, is a lot easier on the body versus the midday sun, or maybe even the sun at the end of the day it has a different energy. It's going into the more yin energy. So like a little bits of both part might be helpful as opposed to, you know, the strong sun in the middle of the day. And is there a direct link between D3 and respiratory health? 
just immune immune function in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and is there a kind of a standard safe adult dosing for vitamin D? Mm. Yeah, I. I mean, if it's really it's really hard for me to say, guys, because okay. um, it's it's really. I mean, yeah, you'd probably be fine with a thousand I use per day, but I mean, is that enough? I don't know. Have you, do you have some weird vitamin D toxicity? Like, it's really hard for me to, to say for sure that, you know, what is safe for you with that kind of, with any supplement, I, I really like to have it be individually based. Great. And let me see, was there anything... There was one question about constitutions, which I know is kind of a really broad topic, but do you want to see if we can talk about it briefly? Well, from a Chinese perspective, um, you know, they talk about fire, you know, and then earth, metal, water, wood, and those are all different constitutions. And you can be predominantly one or predominantly a combination of a couple or you know, some, some manifestation, all that. We are all five. There's no way we can't be. But the imbalances come when um, you're predominantly, you know, uh, out of balance in one of them. So the fire one tends to be like what happens when you see fire comes through. It consumes stuff. It burns things up. It comes in. It's got a big personality. It, and it leaves earth in its tracks. Um, and fire generates earth. Earth is more, it tends to be the groundedness, uh, tends to be um, balanced. That's the planet which we live on. That's the one as our digestion and immune system subject of our talk today. And out of earth, it gives some type of context or some type, you know, the ores at, you know, come out of the earth. So there, therein lies the next element, which is metal imbalance. You know, the metal comes out of the earth. Uh, and the metal tends to be like a rigid thinking, because metal's rigid. Uh, it doesn't like gray areas. It tends to be things are black and white, and those things are typically based in um, how things were in the past. So the way things were in the past, it tells me today whether things are yes or no, but I'm not really open to things being different. That's a very metal imbalance. Metal at the same time is a vessel through which water can flow, you know, and that's the next element. Water imbalance tends to move very strong. You know, water will carve through a mountain, you know, carve through rocks, give it time, it has a way of congregating with others. Um, water imbalances uh, tend to be those who have uh, issues with fear, uh, self esteem, willpower, courage. Um, uh, you know, they think typically everyone else is so wonderful, but they think very low of themselves. Um, at any rate, water is through which, you know, goes into the earth and then wood sprouts up. So there's wood that comes next. And wood, again, is that thing that will, even through a cement, will find a way and will crack through it. So wood constitution, people are very in the future. You know, they're very looking to ahead. And what else can I do? And how do I expand? And how do I extend? You know, that, that can be irritability, anxiety, and depression, things like this. But at the time, you know, with the wood as wood, uh, you know, creates too much wind, then the fire can come in and consumes the wood. And then you're back to fire. So that's, that's how constitution in a nutshell in about two minutes <laughs> works for uh, constitutional. You have to find out which imbalances you have. And each of those imbalances have some physical features of what they look like. They also have some, you know, all the senses, what they look like, what that person smells like, what that person you know, sounds like, you know, what kind of tastes they're interested in, you know, the way they touch things. I mean, it depends on you as a clinician, you know, some of us who are clinicians, which one is our skill set? Some of us are very good listeners. So we can hear when somebody walks in or the way they talk, they sound like they're groaning like this, like this water, this weakness, you know, this kidney bladder issue, or the shouting, you know, it's like very like a liver fire imbalance, you know, um, some of us aren't into the ears as much. Some of us more can, you know, see things from sight. They can pick up things from how they see. And that's from really from a clinician. So it depends on that person seeing a practitioner and the gifts of that practitioner to help them identify, you know, what type of a constitutional imbalance they have. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Ah, so I will address this. Um, this is going to be the last question. It's a little more general in terms of someone 
living in a remote rural area, asking if Chinese medicine is possible with a practitioner from a remote standpoint or after a few in-person sessions. Oh, like tel telemedicine? Right. So if I understand, that's according yeah. to, to state, right? It is state mandated? I was, I was on the phone yesterday with the California Acupuncture Board asking that very question. Yes. And also the American Acupuncture Council or malpractice insurance. Ask now very question, what's going on right now? How can we, who can we see? Is it just for new patients? Is it just for follow-up patients? Definitely follow-up patients. New patients, I was getting the word from American Acupuncture Council, surprised to hear that, not, uh, uh, not the American Acupuncture Council, but the California Acupuncture Board, that even doing telemedicine during these relaxed um, uh, time, you know, these, these, because of such a special time with COVID, um, you know, they've relaxed some of the uh, restrictions so that we can get care out to people that might, it's okay to even do new patients with telemedicine. Uh, you know, mind you that you're practicing within the scope of the state. Uh, and then I asked the question, well, what about somebody even different state? And he, said, and he said, you know, you might want to check the state, but I think it's just the same. As long as you're practicing the scope and you're in that state and you're licensed to practice in that state, state uh, telemedicine, new or follow-up, in state or out of state, uh, just might want to check with that out of state, just just in case, you know, they have their own specific licensure. You know, for example, I was talking with Colorado, and I don't think they have one, so my California one would have the reciprocity because I also have a national licensure. But you'd have to check the state. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that could be super helpful for somebody to work with a, a Chinese. Like you can talk about so many things, and you can even get your herbal prescriptions um, sent to you as well, based on I mean, that visit. And there's much more you can do than besides just needles. Yeah, there's yeah. Much to, much, there's much more to this whole system of medicine yeah. than needles. Right. Everything yeah. that you've talked about, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I think that concludes our talk for today. So once again, we just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has been able to join us live. And thank you to everyone who will be listening to a recording of this at a future time. And in terms of where you can find us, we are online at lotussm.com. There you can also reach out to us via email through our contact page there. Our phone number is also there if you need to give us a call. We are open, practitioners, they, especially in these two in particular, are seeing patients and accepting patients. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Powers. Thank you, Nicole. Thank, thank you. you. Be well, everyone. Stay well. Yes. Take care, everyone. And the recording will come to you at a later date soon. It will be messaged, emailed to you all. <laughs>